Welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church. Healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Ashley, and I am so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, pen, and paper, your phone, however you want to take notes, and get ready for today's message. We're in a series called A Thrill of Hope. It's our Christmas season. We're just a few weeks away from all of the Christmas services. You do not want to miss out. Please, please, please be here. You're going to enjoy it. If you're watching online today, try to get here for the next few services. A lot of great things going on. I went online and I tried to find a video about the three wise men. Even like a parody, something funny or something serious. And I couldn't find anything good on YouTube about the three wise men. So we decided to make a video. I'll have to share it with you. Let's check it out. All right, boys. Here's the deal. We got to decide what we're doing about the holidays. Streets are getting tough out there. Hey, kid, is that you? Yes. Come on in here. <laughs> What's up? What can I do you for, kid? Hey, Dad. Yeah. Can you be the weapon of the church play? Oh, you want us to be the wise men at your church play? Absolutely. We can do you a solid, kid. You got a script for me or something? Yeah. You do? Can I have it? Ah, thanks, kid. Now scram. Get this done for you. All right. Let's see what this kid brought us here in this script. Somebody read it for me. I don't have my bifocals. There were these wise guys from the east. Yeah, but he got that right straight from the east. Yeah, village. east village, kid, the east. The wise men said, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star, and when it rolled, we have come to worship him. Yo, not for nothing. But I don't worship nothing but Mother Mary and my rosary. God, I just got that right. Mother Mary. Wow. All right, let's keep reading. Let's see what this guy say here. For we saw the star, his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. <laughs> and all of Jerusalem with him. Yeah. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. This guy trying to control our territory. I don't know who this, this Herod chief is, but he feeling the heat. He feeling the heat. Why is he trying to roll up with his crew like this, though? I don't know who these scribs are. More like scrubs. <laughs> hold on there. Hold on. Let's just keep reading. All right, all right. He told them, in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, that Herod summoned the wise men. Excuse me, I'm going to edit this. The wise guys. Yeah, the wise, the wise guys. guys. You got the it. Wise guys. Yeah. <laughs> and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the kid. And when you have found him, bring me word. That I too may come and worship him. Yeah, yo, I ain't telling this dude nothing. You know the word on the streets, snitches get stitches. I ain't telling him nothing. That's for real, yo. He's trying to squeeze Chief. What are we going to do? All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go get this Herod guy. All right, so wise guys ain't always wise men. Fun fact, Pastor Josh, all his lines got cut because he couldn't stay with the accent. <laughs> so he got downgraded to mumbling and subtitles. He started with the, uh, you know, the Italian accent and then he went Southern. And then by the time we were done, it was Asian. <laughs> it's sad, I, I, wish it was, I wish I was joking. All right, not to pass judgment, nothing like that, but let's just talk about facts. How many in here were taught and know the story of the wise men, the three wise men? All right, you heard it at some point. Okay, so let's just ask a question. How many wise men were at the manger scene when Jesus was born? 
How many? Shout it out. No, there was zero. Zero. Zero wise men were at Jesus' birth. So I don't know if it's called anatomically correct, but the manger scene that showed three wise men, they were not there. Shepherds were there. Shepherds from a field watching their flocks by night, they were at the birth of Jesus, but the wise men were not. They came years later, months, months, years later, okay? But when the wise men did show up, how many were there? We have no idea. We have no idea. The only thing we know is that there were three gifts. And what were they? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So if you were a little distracted by the humor of the video, I will go back and read you this passage of scripture straight out of Matthew 2, verse 1. It says this, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? For we saw his star and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. Remember that, that's that's an important fact. All of Jerusalem was worried as well, okay? And they assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and inquired of them where Christ was to be born. And they told them in Bethlehem of Judea, for it was written by the prophet, saying, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judea, of Judah, I'm sorry. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned those wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem. And p- pretty much, he said, All right, come back and tell me what happened, where they're at, so that I may go worship him too. And we know that that was a setup. Herod did not want to go worship them. Herod wanted to go kill him, right? But when they had seen the star, they rejoiced in exceedingly joy. They came to the house where Mary was with her child. They fell down and worshiped him, and they opened their treasures. And they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream, the wise men did not go back the way that they came, but departed to their homeland another way. All right, that's the story of the three wise men, or you can call them magi, M-A-G-I, the magi. They were pretty much Persian kings that came to worship Jesus. They brought him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I asked you the questions before about what you believed or how many wise men were there because we believe what we believe because of what we have seen, what we have heard, and what we have been taught. I was raised in Sunday school in the 80s. Before we had TVs in classrooms, before we had projectors, we had something called flannel graph. Did anybody in here ever go to church when there was flannel graph? Yes, you know what's up, flannel graph. All right, a piece of flannel, you had cut out characters and they would stick to the flannel and they told stories on flannel graph. It was before we could afford puppets. I mean, it was like the lowest of the low, like paper cutouts to tell the stories of the Bible. And yes, we thought, man, there were three wise men. The truth of the matter is we don't know how many wise men there were, but we believe because that's what we've been taught. We believe because that's what we've been taught. We believe because that's what we've seen. We believe because that's what we have heard. And this brings me to a point that I want to make today is that we all follow something or we all follow someone. We all follow something or someone. And if you're in the generation today that has social media, you follow probably a couple hundred people. You click a button and it's that easy. Follow. I'm a follower. I follow them. But because you clicked a button called follower, does it really mean that you follow them? I mean, just because you clicked a button as a follower of Jenny Craig, does that mean that you follow her diet? 
Huh? You follow someone who's whatever, an influencer. Are you actually doing everything they say to do? And my question today is this, is who and what are you following? Who and what are you following? I believe it's so easy to say, I follow Jesus, but do I really? Did I click the button follower? Or do I live the life follower? There's a couple lessons that I want to look at that I believe these magi teach us. Three lessons today that I want to pull out of this story. And the first one starts me with this question. How did these magi know to follow a star? How did they know? Like for me, if I woke up this morning, and let's just say there wasn't snow, let's say it was a clear, sunny sky this morning, and I looked up, or I'm sorry, it went, this wouldn't happen, sunny sky. It's a <laughs> dark sky, and I look up, and all of a sudden there's this brand new star shining in the sky. I wouldn't know it's a new star. I would, never, I would have no idea. Honestly, I don't even know what the North Star looks like. I don't know where the Milky Way is. I don't know where, like, the little thing that looks like a frying pan. I don't know any of that stuff. Like, if I went outside and saw stars, I'd like, oh, man, that's cool. I can see the stars today. I'm like, oh, but listen, that one is this, and this one's that, and hold on. I don't know any of that. How did these guys know, like, oh, my gosh, there's a star there that didn't exist there before. Let's follow it. Because they were looking for it. They were looking for it. Now, some people believe that this star was so bright that it was like shining like the sun. It was so bright. But anyway, they were looking for it. Numbers 24, 17, Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, way back in the beginning. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheph. There's this prophecy that's saying that there is going to be a star that rises out of, out of Jacob. Now, whether it was a literal star or a figurative star, it doesn't really matter. They believed it was literal. And therefore, because they heard this prophecy that a star would appear, a star would rise, they began to look for it. They began to look for it. So here's my question today. Do you look to God's word to then expect his word to perform in your life? Here's the lesson. Expect God's word to perform as promised. Let me paint this picture a little clearer. Do you find a scripture and say, look, this scripture is speaking to my life, and now I'm going to expect it to happen in my life? Yep, that's probably why we're not following stars, because <laughs> we're not. We're not finding scripture that has a promise to us. All right, when sickness comes to your household, with long life will I satisfy thee, the scripture says. He says that healing is the children's bread. He said that his yoke is easy, his burden is light. That's talked about salvation, but it also talks about healing coming upon us. Do we know what the word says to sit in expectation that God will perform? When we came to church today, did we expect the word to speak to us a living promise? See, I would dare say that a lot of times we're getting exactly what we expect. Not a lot. Not a lot. These wise men, these magi, constantly were looking at the skies, waiting for the prophecy to be fulfilled because it was a word to them. It was God's word to them. And what is God's word to you? Expect his word to perform. I have a saying in my life, and it goes like this. God's word says it. I believe it. That settles it. Pastor Mike, how can you believe some of this stuff? Like, how, how can you, listen, faith is a decision, not a feeling. Faith is a decision, not a feeling. Faith doesn't need evidence for me to have it. Ooh. 
If I had evidence, then it doesn't take faith. Just throw it out there to you guys. If you have evidence, then it doesn't take faith. Ooh, I know. That's the hard part of faith. They believed something because the word said it, because they had scripture. And they waited for the appearance. Lesson number two. The wise men knew where to look. They knew where to look up. They knew where to look. Too many of us are focused on the wrong things. We're focused on our dysfunctions instead of the greatness that God has placed in each and every one of us. Sometimes we, we're so focused on the anxiety and the depression in our lives, the shortcomings, the sin in our lives, and we're not focused on the greatness in our lives. Now hear me, every single one of us has greatness in us. I'll tell you this, you're not going to be great at everything. There's some things that you just think at. Just stop doing that. <laughs> Get somebody else who's great at it and let them do it. Right? That, you know, Vincent knows. There's some people who should just not paint. Like, don't paint your wall. Hire somebody to paint your wall. You can't do it. It's just not in you. That's okay. Hire somebody. But every single one of us has a unique brilliance, a God-given brilliance that's put in us, and we need to focus on that. Too many times, man, we're so focused on the bad parts of our lives, and we end up smacking into them over and over again. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. And we step right into the thing we keep focusing on not doing. Well, what's the key? Hebrews 12, 2 tells us this. Looking unto Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. So what was he focused on? The joy set before him. So even in the moment of the cross, where he's bearing sin and he's bearing pain, he's not focused on that moment. He's focused on the joy before him. He's focused on the outcome of the current situation. For the joy set before him, he's no, even Jesus knows where to look. And what's that place Psalm 121 tells us? I lift my eyes to the hills from where my help comes. My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. We've got to look up. Our help comes from above. Our help is not going to come here and here and all around. My last lesson is going to totally mess up your theology when it comes to the wise men. But like I said, don't ever believe a word I say. Don't believe anything I say. Please, don't be a naive person. Don't even believe that anything I said is even in the Bible. Go look it up. I do have a plan one day. I am going to stand up here and preach straight heresy. Everything I say is going to be a complete lie. One day, just to see if everybody goes and studies it and proves me wrong. Do not, listen, don't go to church and believe everything they say. That's how we just live a lives of deceit, man, deception. But check this out. Just wonder. Pretend with me for a minute. Pretend. I want, I want to take you down this road. Lesson number three that I want to show you is that the wise men were highly generous people. Now, in our little manger illustrations where we have the three wise men at the manger, which they were not at, right? So we already know that we've been lied to. Yes? No? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yes, they're there. I threw mine away. You, get, <laughs> you have the wise men sitting there with this little, tiny little treasure chest, like this big, of gold. And they're so proud of it, right? They got the smile on their face with their big hat. I traveled nine months on camelback over water and woods and fields to bring you a $5 gift. Really? Is that really how it went down? Okay, these magi were Persian kings. Kings. And if a king went to go visit another king, come on, you've seen the movies. He comes before him with great gifts. Like the way you present a gift to a king is with splendor. 
It's with splendor. Because that's how you keep the honor among kings. Matthew 2.11, and going to the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They fell down and worshiped him, and they opened their treasures, and they offered gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They didn't open up their little snap purse and say, oh, I think I have a few quarters, they're cutie. <laughs> so there's two theological beliefs on how much gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And I think based upon this theology is going to place you in how you look at God. One stance says that the Magi brought just enough gold, just enough frankincense and myrrh to pay off their debt, to pay off the manger rental, maybe to pay off their house, just enough. And that the frankincense and myrrh, the myrrh was saved to use to embalm Jesus and that was it. It's just enough. God's not too much, but it's just enough. He's never early, but he's never late. You know, this whole. But then there's another side. And I wonder if you could picture your heavenly father this splendor, in this splendor. I found a study online, and I can't prove it, but I can't prove any of this. I can't prove that it was little chests, and I can't prove it was big chests. But there was a uh, a Christian billionaire named Peter J. Daniels. And he commissioned a team of historians to research the Magi and the gifts that they brought to Jesus when he was born. Their conclusion was, are you ready for this? It's going to blow your mind. Because we're, we're nowhere near in the same ballpark. Their conclusion was that there was over 300 Persian kings that came bearing gifts to Jesus' family with a calculated wealth of over $4 million by today's standards. He said, by Persian documents, it showed that the, gift was, that the gift was escorted by an army of people. And if you knew about how Persian kings traveled, they always traveled with an army to protect their assets, to protect the treasure. Now when we go back in Matthew 2, verse 2, when it says that, Herod was troubled, and all of Jerusalem. Why was all of Jerusalem troubled? Because you have this entourage coming through. They thought they were being invaded. Because the entourage of the gifts to Jesus was so big, so massive. Again, I can't prove that. But I can't prove that it was a small gift either. But what I do feel this does is it places where our heart is. Was Jesus a wealthy young man who led with grace and truth and power that never looked down upon anybody of a lower class? Never did. He was the only one who could bridge the two. Or was he, like the Bible says, had no place to lay his head because he was poor. Was Jesus poor? Was he rich? Oh, maybe he was somewhere in the middle. Wonder if he wasn't. Wonder if he was stinking wealthy, rich. And that's how he could afford the things that he did. The Bible says that when he was crucified on the cross, that they did not tear his garment ret. They not tear it apart, but they cast lots. They gambled for who could win it because it was a wealthy priestly garment. Yeah. Yeah. All I'm asking you is this. Maybe the things that we've believed about Jesus, maybe the things that we've been taught and that we learned that we've seen in the Bible have skewed our view of how we follow Christ, how we follow God. Maybe it's easy to not have a generous heart because we don't think that God the Father was generous in providing for his son. I do make jokes about it. I believe the gifts from the wise men of gold, frankincense, and were were God paying child support. God paid child support. And he paid it very well. He took care of Jesus. He gave him a good life. I make jokes about that, but like wonder if God the Father is that generous to his children 
to his people? Is it easier for you to believe that Jesus was poor, or is it easier to believe that he was wealthy? It might, put, it might pin you to where you are and how you view God. And guess what? It's a personal thing. It's a personal thing. And I think for the person that needs to think one side or the other, it's there. It's in Scripture. So that you can identify with Christ the way that you need to identify him. So I'm going to bring this all together now. Who or what are you following? Are you a Jesus follower or are you like the four wise guys in our show, our our video, who are simply going to play a role, play, play a part in a Christian play, saying we're wise men, saying we follow but we don't really follow. We say we're following a diet, but we're really adding some extra salt. Right? To follow means you're following. To follow Jesus Christ means that you put him at the center of every decision that you make. It's not simply following some rules. It's not simply following some lifestyle. It's putting him at the center of all things. That's being a Jesus follower. It's not the fish bumper sticker or a Christian t-shirt. It's saying, Lord, I give you access to all parts of my life, the good, the bad, the ugly, and we all have it. If you think that you're a perfect person, you ain't got no ugly parts in your life, well, that right there is the ugly part, your pride. Your pride stank, right? We all have ugly in us. Some, it just (laughs) comes out (laughs) differently than others, right? Some people let ugly out their mouth. Some people thinking ugly all day long. This holiday season, could we let the word have its perfect work in our lives? You see, he's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. We're either a Jesus follower or we're just one of those who know his name. And it's not the same. We're going to produce different fruit. And I'm not being accusatory, and I'm not shaming, but are you following the bright and morning star, Jesus Christ? Are you following him? Is he leading your life? Is he directing you? Do you consult him before you make the major decisions in your life? Can I just help somebody today? If you keep making bad decisions, I could probably guess by 99% accuracy that you didn't pray before you made that decision. And if you did, you didn't listen to the answer. You prayed and then made up your own answer. But when you choose to follow Jesus, it says that he will lead you into all truth. He will lead you into all truth. I want to follow that. Maybe there's some things online I need to unfollow so that I can have room and time to follow the way, the truth, and the life, which is Jesus Christ. If you're watching online and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you've never began to follow that star, I want to offer that to you today if you're in the room and you've never prayed the prayer of salvation, we'd like to pray that with you today. It goes like this, dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to familychurchny.com or email us at team at familychurchny.com to get started today.